this is not a bilateral issue of Poland, Latvia, Lithuania and Belarus. This is a challenge to the whole of the European Union. And this is not a migration crisis. This is the attempt of an authoritarian regime to try to destabilize its democratic neighbors. Hi, everyone, and welcome to another edition of Backstory. I'm Dana Lewis. That was Ursula von der Leyen, the European Commission head, after meeting President Biden in Washington. What's she talking about? Belarus and refugees being used as weapons against Europe by Belarusian dictator Alexander Lukashenko. Belarus is a tiny country on the edge of Europe, on the border with Russia. Its dictator, Alexander Lukashenko, lost an election last year but refused to step down. Instead, he started locking up and brutalizing thousands of people. Then he ordered the hijacking of a Ryanair flight crossing his airspace, but bound between two NATO countries. He did it to arrest a journalist. Lukashenko's political opposition has had to flee to neighboring Poland or Lithuania to save themselves from torture and prison. Lukashenko has created a pariah state on the edge of Europe. The EU and the US took out sanctions against him. And now, now, Lukashenko is luring migrants who want to enter Europe to Belarus and then pushing them into Poland and Lithuania to destabilize those nations and to pay Europe back for sanctions. And he appears to be doing all this with the support of Russian President Vladimir Putin, who wants to bring Belarus back under Russian control. Lukashenko will support the so-called union with Russia because he has nowhere to turn now but Russia. On this backstory, we talk to the ambassador for Lithuania, who along with Poland says no doubt Russia has a hand in all this and Lukashenko must be stopped by a united Europe. But first on backstory, there are tens of thousands of people trapped in Afghanistan. You already know that on August 15th, the Taliban took control of Kabul. And since then, we know very little about how many Afghans who worked with U.S. or NATO forces have been killed or jailed. But there are all kinds of horror stories emerging. Payback for cooperating with U.S. troops over the last 20 years under the Taliban, that usually means death. And some of those trapped weren't Afghan soldiers or police, but a lot of them are just people who hold British or U.S. or Canadian or all kinds of foreign passports and they can't get out unless someone helps them. And that's where Project Dynamo comes in. All right, let's talk about Afghanistan now. It has been months since headline news on your televisions every day where you saw uh, American forces at the Kabul airport surrounded by the Taliban taking people uh, out of Afghanistan, trying to evacuate people who had worked with Americans uh, who were in harm's way. The stories moved to the back pages, but I'll tell you what, it has become more dire. Uh, the situation is a very big crisis for so many Afghans who cannot get out of Afghanistan, who are trapped, some of them being hunted by the Taliban because of their previous relationship with U.S. forces or NATO forces. And there's a guy named Brian Stern who joins me now. Uh, Brian, I believe in your, you're in New York right now. Yeah, Dana, thanks for having me. I really appreciate it. I'm in, uh, I'm in New York right now. We're getting ready to launch tomorrow, probably. Uh, we're, we're having some challenges this morning. but uh, right. So I, I have to introduce you a little bit better than a, there's a guy I know called Brian Stern, because you are running a project called Dynamo, uh, and you are one of the few organizations that have actually been able to get some of these people out of Afghanistan uh, with their kids, with their families, Tell me how you're doing it and tell me how critical the situation is right now. Uh, I'll answer the question in reverse. Uh, uh, how critical is the situation? It's dire. Uh, we're seeing all kinds of indications from inside the country, inside Afghanistan, uh, both geopolitically, economically, culturally, and even with things like weather. The, the winter in Afghanistan is a very, very, very real thing that impacts the entire country. So from a ticking clock perspective, there's multiple facets of the situation, all of which are indicating bad, not good. Uh, 
Right. I so, mean, all, all Afghans will face a horrible winter. All Afghans correct. will face f- famine conditions in parts of the country. They are going hungry. The, the economy has collapsed. But the people you are helping in particular, are, I assume, are people who have had relationships with U.S. forces in the past because you're a veteran. Um, yes. And you have worked with some of these people. C- correct. So the the uh, Project Dynamo Project Dynamo was predicated on the idea of don't be a spectator, right? So things went bad, and we wanted to get close to the problem. The people that we're helping are anyone and anyone that we can. And how are we helping them in any way that we can? Sometimes it's by airplane. Sometimes that's by border crossing. Uh, sometimes that's in a car. Sometimes it's in the foot. If there was uh, by by foot. If there was, if, if Afghanistan wasn't landlocked, I'd be using rowboats too. So we don't, uh, we tend to focus on the aviation piece because I can move a significant, uh, a large amount of people in one shot. But Before the reality we talk about is, how will you just talk to me sure. about who? Will you give me who? Give me some examples of so, the kinds of people you're in touch with that you've helped and that you're getting out yeah. or need to get out. Yeah, so we have a database. We, uh, projectdynamo.org is our database. That's where you can donate. We are donor funded. A uh, little plug. Um, uh, that's also where you. Re- that, that's also where you register. Uh, so if you're an Afghan, you're an, you're an Afghan American. You're an Afghan Canadian. You're a whatever you are in country inside Afghanistan. That's where you go and register and upload your documents. The people that we're focusing on tend to be. Uh, um, Wrong to say any one demographic, but we have to we have to chop into tranches, if you will. So American citizens, Canadian citizens, British citizens are on my next flight. I also have green card holders, also known as LPRs, lawful permanent residents uh, of Canada, of England, of America. I also have vulnerable populations such as journalists. Uh, we have a, a manifest of a number of journalists who were, uh, t- they were t- Afghan TV journalists who did nothing but slam the Taliban every single day from a media and journalism perspective, trying to demonstrate freedom of speech and the power of the press and all those things. Their, their faces are known by everybody. They're Googleable, And if you Google them, it comes up as anti-Taliban stuff. They too are in country. We have all, all kinds of groups that are vulnerable. We don't, we don't, we tend. What about uh, policemen? What about soldiers? What about special forces, Afghan special forces? Yep. All of those, we, I assume. We, 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 we try, we, we try to help them also. We try and help everybody. If I have a way to get somebody out and they need to be out, we try and pursue it. Uh, what I'll say is, is that what we've seen is, is that there's a lot of people who are just as vulnerable, if not more vulnerable, who, who were not kinetic, meaning uh, Afghan judges, Afghan lawyers, Afghan journalists, people who were not soldiers per se, who were in their own right against the Taliban by, with, and through our influence, our policy in 20 years of war. So yes, we care and, and have moved many, 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 many Afghan national security officials, high level people, uh, Afghan intelligence officers, all kinds of folks. Um, but our, I'll say that if I had to pick an Afghan journalist or an Afghan commando, the Afghan commando in many cases can take care of himself. Maybe his family is a problem, but if you're a female Afghan journalist who is all over TV and you're trapped in Afghanistan and you're surrounded by the Taliban, you don't have a lot of help and you certainly don't have the training. Tell me how. Do you get them to the border? Do they get there themselves? How do you get these people out now? So, so the genius of Dynamo, uh, there's, there's lots of groups out there, and all the and all these groups are doing the best that they can with what they can in a very, 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 very hard environment. There's no funding, money is dried up, donor money is dried up. So we're all working on shoestring budgets. Uh, the answer is, is we move anyone any way that we can. The genius of Dynamo, unlike a lot of other groups, is we call it the mouse trap, meaning. Once we start the process with you, you're an Afghan Canadian and you're in downtown Kabul and you don't want to be in Kabul anymore because you, <laughs> that's bad. And you want to end up in Canada. You enter into our process and from safe houses to buses to COVID tests to measles shots to buses to where you need to go to flights to where you need to go to wherever it is, 
we don't really stop. We don't really stop until you get to where you need to be. It, so it sounds mind boggling and tremendously challenging. It, uh, it is challenging. It is challenging, but we've really cracked the code on a lot of these things. And notwithstanding funding, we could move thousands of people a week if I had money. So the, the, we, we've cracked the code on a lot of these things. It's a dynamic situation, meaning via land crossing is an example. Today, the Uzbek border is closed. Who know, it, it was open last week. Who knows what tomorrow will bring? So, th you know, it's dynamic and it's fluid. We're able to shift and lift and spar and parry and roll with the punches in such a way that once we kind of start with somebody, we know that we can finish. Via airplane is the best way because we can we can move a large and a really large amount of people in, in one sitting. Our last flight was 113 U.S. persons. Every did single one of them helped. And where did you help them to? Because they're not guaranteed uh, getting to the U.S. or Canada, right? C c correct. So uh, we don't know how many people we've helped. We don't keep. It's not a. We don't. I know how many people I have left. We know it's a couple thousand. Um, I, there's a whole bunch that we can definitely verify, and it's easy to track those. But there's many that we've touched where where our fingerprints are on them. That that it was simple assistance. It wasn't necessarily a rescue. I, I it certainly counts. We certainly had a hand in saving their lives and all the other good stuff. But but you know, we're, our passion is not making phone calls. Our passion is getting on the plane, meeting the people, and executing the operation. How many you know? people have you actually flown out, and where did you fly them to? Uh, our last big flight, uh, last big flight was 113 people, and they landed in Chicago. And will so Chicago we, will, will the U.S. take them? They're Americans. They just went home. So the, those, are, those are the easy ones. Those are American passport holders, right? But what, what about the, the, those are. What about the guy who uh, was a, a a fixer translator with U.S. Special Forces? Um, yeah. So uh, uh, a lot of those guys, uh, a lot of those guys, go to third party countries. The the uh, what people call lily pads, which is go to a place until your visa gets approved. Yeah. Uh, Ru Rwanda, Georgia, Albania, the uh, uh, Abu Dhabi. Um, we're looking at some options in Colombia, in uh, Latin America, Colombia being one of them, Panama being another, Brazil being another. Uh, we haven't executed those yet, but we have people all over. Greece has taken people. Ireland has taken people. Uh, Cyp uh, I think Cyprus took a few. So country, countries are taking people. Uh, they are. It's wrong to say that the world, it is incorrect to say that the world community is rejecting this in totality exactly accurate but the reality is is there's 35 million people that live in afghanistan and 34 million want to live somewhere else so um it's a very dire situation it really is and, and um people people i think a lot of people have been very critical especially of the american government but of the ally of, of nato of you know well 20 years and you know you left it worse than you found it and uh, made no progress and i i reject all that that's just not true. I spent a lot of time there, spent a lot of time there. And there was a time where people wanted to stay in Afghanistan. 20 years later, no, with the Taliban, people, people, there, there was a time where people enjoy Taliban controlled Afghanistan. Today, that's clearly not the case. So, so without doing any hard math, at the very least, the influence piece worked out just fine, militarily and politically and all those other things is kind of complicated. But, but every Afghan woman that I've ever met talks about school every afghan child that i met talks right, about so these, school these, and education your, your point is that these are permanent positive changes that have happened absolutely. in the country and that's a legacy absolutely 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 so, two questions the u.s government uh nato allied governments have they just kind of given up when they shouldn't have and they should still be helping people get out um number one they are still helping people get out uh, that they are. It is just extremely hard. It is very complicated. The State Department, uh, British government, Canadian governments are all, all have massive task forces, which are with a lot of human capital and real capital dedicated towards the problem set. I work with the State Department constantly, almost daily. And I will say that 
it is a hard situation, but it is not for lack of effort at all. Uh, it is just very difficult and governments work at the speed of government sometimes. That's not, that's not the State Department's fault. That's just the way the world turns. So how are you able to maybe cut a few corners and get it done quicker? We uh, we're, we're, we don't cut it. So number one, Dynamo doesn't break any laws. We're not smuggling people. Yeah, and I didn't mean borders. to imply that. I just, yeah. I just mean yeah, yeah, yeah. Maybe, you're, maybe you're a bit lighter and, and faster on your it, feet. Let, let, like, any, like anything else, right? It, 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 if you're a private organization, it's all about the the getting, you know, it, it's not about the bureaucracy piece. You know, I, I hate spreadsheets. I hate memos. I hate PowerPoint. I hate all these things. And in government, those are requirements. Those are necessities. There's a, there's oversight. There's approval. There's tax dollars. And oh, I'm not um, saying that's wrong. I think that's a, a, I appreciate that there's oversight as to how my tax dollars are spent. I appreciate that, Right. Uh, I, you know, we're donor funded. I make sure to track every single penny that we spend because I assume that one day a donor is going to say, hey, where did my money go? And I want to be able to explain to them. So as but a private you're organization- able, You're able from the point of contact of somebody in trouble, you're able to get them out much quicker. Exactly right. You know, it, it, we see this in the military. You know, who's more of a lethal force, a battalion of infantry or a platoon of special forces guys? Depending on the day, those special forces guys might be, even though smaller, more combat effective, just based on the way that they operate and are organized and man trained and equipped. That doesn't mean that they're better or worse. They're just, it's a function of, of ability. Brian, I know you got to go with the last question. How can people help you? I mean, I, I don't think you're talking about huge amounts of money, but chartering nope. airplanes is not a small amount of money either. Yeah, so uh, projectdynamo.org, we take every kind of funding that there is. We have Venmo, we do wire transfers. If you have money, we want your money, we need your money. Uh, the planes don't fly themselves, the landing clearances are expensive, food and all the safe houses and buses and COVID shots, are, COVID tests are 100, 150 bucks a shot, a test in downtown Kabul. Uh, I, we are the proud owner of the only COVID PCR rapid test in the country, and it's 150 bucks to to do the to do the thing. Uh, MMR shots are 117 dollars, uh, 100 and, uh, 107 dollars a piece. So uh, everyone who gets on when you come into the process, everyone gets a COVID test and everyone gets a measles shot without doing any hard yeah. math. Without you know, it's a couple hundred bucks per person. So we need help financially in a very real way. Tactically, uh, I need I need people with money to give to to be kind and help with this. Uh, and I and, and or people who have big big aircraft that don't mind flying into Afghanistan. I'll take either one. Those are both okay for me. Uh, but we're focusing on our next manifest is British uh, American Americans, Canadian and British either citizens children, uh, green card holders, and we have a bunch of vulnerable people also that we're doing a cross-border operation with. Uh, we hope to move 300 in the, in the next two weeks. Brian Stern, thank you so much. Good to talk to you and good luck. Thanks, Dana. I really appreciate it. Thanks for having me. All right, Linus Linkovicius is a Lithuanian diplomat. He is an ambassador at large. He was a former foreign minister and former minister of defense. Hi, sir. And good, to, good to have you. Good to talk to you again. I mean, what is happening on the Belarusian Polish border right now? How would you characterize it? No, it's characterized already by uh, various institutions as hybrid attack, which is really definitely this is true. But now I, would, I would add that now it's also kind of humanitarian uh, situation because uh, of very clear reasons. You know, these people which were collected in Minsk as tourists invited by the regime, then converted to migrants brought to the border and they were attempts to cross the border illegally uh, in various places, first in Lithuania, later in Poland. And uh, these people, where you so to say this group was enlarged uh, every, every, every day, every week, and uh, they went too many. And I can assume that dictator take a took a decision to get rid of them and uh, simply push pushing them to the border. And now we have thousands of them gathered uh, by Polish border and with no way back, no way forward. 
And uh, in the conditions which are definitely very difficult, because you probably know there's minus temperature, uh, and uh, these people are not used to that, to say the least. And there are also some women and, uh, and also some minors. Uh, so this is also in addition to, to what we were describing before, it's humanitarian really disaster and it should be taken quite quickly by international organizations, by all international organizations uh, in order to make sure that this is not acceptable. Linus, uh, Mr. Ambassador, I mean, when you say they were collected, you're saying that this was not a natural migration uh, as we've yeah. seen in other parts of Europe from North Africa and Syria and elsewhere, you're saying that President Lukashenko did what? Yeah, it, indeed, I had, had in mind that that was artificially made. By, by the way, to, to recall uh, this uh, recent history, you probably remember after the hijacking of Ryanair plane and after some sanctions introduced against uh, the Russian uh, Belavia, uh, so to say, company, uh, uh, he made a statement public statement that he will flood, I will quote, by migrants and drugs, European Union. And this process started almost immediately, I would say. Right. Let me, let me that, interrupt. So, so because I, I want, let's quote it directly. On May the 26th, he yeah. said, we used to stop the drugs and migrants. Now you'll have to catch them yourselves. And then on June 22nd, he went even further. You launched a hybrid war versus us and demand we protect you like before, question mark? Mm -hmm. What was he yeah, saying? Indeed. indeed, and also it was a uh, reason to make some kind of trade-off, I would say, which is also usual for this regime. It had to do with the uh, political prisoners, if you remember, when they re released, uh, it was uh, again kind of uh, motivation maybe to lift sanctions. And now there were also hints made by him and also by Russia, uh, if you remember, that pay some money and they will try to to manage this 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 crisis. So this is that as was, easy as that was is. said again by the Russian Foreign Minister Lavrov mm -hmm. yesterday. This week he said, "Well, Indeed. maybe there should be some kind of financial arrangement." I mean, is there yeah. are they really seeking some money for migrants? Well, they're seeking to to leave sanctions, you know, because it looks that these sanctions, although they are not sufficient, one can say, you know, could be more efficient. But any anyway, they are working. They are working. They are painful. And they have to do something. And by the way, the Lukashenko also he himself, if we are following the events, he feels not quite confident in the situation. And he also feels that he's probably will, will be not be needed for Kremlin, even not only for his own people. And he, his, his uh, actions sometimes really not predictable. And that's also one more reason why you even don't know what to expect. The Polish prime minister has accused President Putin of Russia of orchestrating this. What would you say about Putin and Russia and their role in this? Since Lukashenko lost an election, he's been well, locking you know, up his own people, jailing his opposition. There are widespread claims of torture. As you mentioned, he hijacked the Ryanair flight that was between two NATO countries uh, mm. and arrested a journalist. Sanctions were taken out. What is Russia's role? Unfortunately, we can see lately, it's not, it started not yesterday, by the way, when Russia uh, instigating crisis and uh, launching some kind of crisis in various regions. And through this uh, crisis, they can manage the situation, not as a peace dealer, not as a manager, but as a, as a kind of stakeholder. And uh, this is not exception. This is not exception at all, uh, given uh, the fact that uh, this is also known, even not for the experts, that this country disappearing. As, as we can speak, uh, de facto, de facto disappearing as independent state. It took so long, uh, implementation of the so-called uh, two-state union agreement. It lasts more than 20 years. It was very difficult uh, for, from time to time to, to, to realize, to implement, implement. But now when this leader is not legitimate, first of all, leader, he's uh, really vulnerable, he's weak, and uh, they are using whatever they can to, to absorb that country fully and to, to make sure that this is definitely kind of integrated part, maybe de facto, uh, and maybe not the Europe. And so uh, with all consequences, including like a training field for some methods. So whatever it's, uh, they are doing, I doubt that it's done without coordination with Kremlin. It's simply not possible but because whatever they are doing, it's done in coordination after consultation sometimes. And if you're following meetings of uh, so-called two, two, two leaders, 
uh, they are also taking place around these events, around this hijacking. In fact, Lukashenko just met with President Putin a couple of days ago. Exactly. So, and they talked on phone recently about situation on the border. Also discussed this. This and uh, so to, to say that this is done without coordination or without knowledge or even maybe without guidance would be really too much. So we definitely should look at Russia as a source of all this, uh, what is happening, and of, of the reason of all of that. Without responsibility, usually, you know, Russia usually uh, enjoys the uh, role of backseat driver in whatever crisis they instigated themselves. And distancing from what is happening, be it Crimea, be it Donbass, Syria, be, be it now migration crisis, this is really becoming a habit and it shouldn't be taken uh, for simple reasons by international community. It went too much, too many examples, too many precedents to make sure that this is definitely something like a scam and cannot be taken like this. What is the point? Are they trying to, I understand Lukashenko's point. He's trying to put pressure on Europe to withdraw sanctions. <laughs> What is President Putin doing, or is this just his normal course of trying to destabilize the EU whenever he can? He tries to destabilize, also trying to divide, uh, also testing resilience. This is happening from the, I would say, war in South Caucasus in 2008, so nothing new shouldn't surprise anyone. And he's testing how far he can go, how deep, deep he, can, he can go without reaction or without proper reaction. If this price is agreeable, he's continuing to do the same. So I mentioned already the South Caucasus and uh, occupation of 20% of Georgian territory. Uh, we know all of us that nothing happened after that, basically. And no changes even in rhetorics. And now later we have annexation of Crimea, we have now uh, aggression against Donbass, and all these methods are tested. And the, the, if, if it's possible, they are going on, you know, simply. And uh, really, you're right, destabilize the European Union, make it weaker. Uh, also testing resilience, uh, ability to react to the threats, because the only arguments they can use, again, unfortunately, this is not positive approach. This is kind of creation conflict and through the conflict becoming important, uh, becoming, so to say, reasonable. And uh, and this is, this is how it works. Why is Lithuania declared an emergency? Lithuania's parliament declared a state of emergency at the country's border with Belarus on Tuesday. Um, it allows border guards to use mental coercion, proportional physical violence to prevent migrants from entering Lithuania, uh, bans all travel to within five kilometers of the Belarus border unless allowed by border guards. Yeah, since we're watching the situation and what is happening now in our neighborhood, uh, this is neighborhood very close, I would say. It's 40 kilometers, you know, something 30 kilometers where what is happening. And definitely all, all these crowds uh, could be redirected re very easily to other direction, uh, which was the case already last night. We have almost up to 300 attempts to cross the border, which was three times more than no normally, which is not normal at all. But nevertheless, this is a big increase. And there were also reports that some crowds were re redirected again to our uh, border. So we have to take measures. And uh, that's that's important to note. You, you, should, you should know probably, and, and uh, the length of the border is much, much longer. 670 kilometers, it's really much more than with our neighbors in Poland. And, you know, this border is definitely not well protected everywhere. Not everywhere we have technical measures, and uh, we need a lot of sort of personnel to do that. So it's not easy. And uh, this uh, emergency uh, status will help us to uh, collect, so to say, more resources to take, uh, take this uh, challenge properly. Is this an Article 5 situation for NATO? You, Lithuania, Poland are both NATO members. The people see this as, a, as hybrid warfare, uh, characterizing it as an attack by, certainly by Lukashenko and by extension, possibly by Russia. Is it an Article 5 situation where members of the EU and members of NATO have to support Lithuania and Poland and anybody else uh, who are having migrants pushed at their border like that? I would say it's more discussed in the context of Article 4, <laughs> just consultations, not yet Article 5, but even Article 4 was launched maybe five times, if I remember correctly. In the history, it's not very often happening. And this is, it has to do with military threat, basically, and it's not yet the case. Uh, whatever is happening, it's hybrid. It's massive. It's really confused, confusion and uh, 
big, big problem, but uh, we should keep in the arsenal all these uh, leverages, including Article 4, consultations with the allies. I shouldn't say it's not happening. Hybrid team was dispatched to Lithuania some time ago, and they looked at the situation quite carefully in depth. Uh, analyzing, so our our allies are observing. Uh, it's it's uh, so to say, not to say that no no contacts and no, no information shared with them. This is not true, but uh, it's not yet time maybe to look at that as a military. Uh, fortunately, it's not yet military threat, but who knows? Uh, provocations could be whatever. How do people inside Lithuania view this? I mean, do, are they are they uh, w- with fear, worrying that this situation is starting to escalate along the Polish border? along the Lithuanian border, um, and that the the end game uh, really is to destabilize NATO countries. No, people, of course, are not relaxed, especially in the border areas. They're watching television, they're reading papers and following what is happening in social media. And uh, those reports they're receiving uh, definitely cannot uh, satisfy anyone. So people are concerned. I shouldn't say this is panic. No, it's by far not yet the case. Uh, but we are, we are vigilant, vigilant. Uh, we are looking at the station very seriously, and uh, I, I believe that people sharing, mostly sharing all these measures which were taken by the government so far, and we also try to reach this uh, across party agreement, which shouldn't be uh, discrepancies in the views of political parties, that's also very important, so it's discussed uh, from time to time the parliament. And this decision, which was uh, reached uh, in the parliament uh, in producing this emergency status was also done after consultations across all spectrum political forces. So this is exactly what we feel. And people, lately people everywhere were were quite concerned. Too too many challenges for them. This is migration. Also, let's not forget pandemics. So this time is not easy. And that's uh, also the case why people are really quite concerned. Is there a link to the buildup of Russian forces on the Ukrainian border and what President Putin is doing there as well? Uh, Russian forces, you meant, yeah? I'm sorry, Russian forces on the Ukrainian border. Is there a, let me ask you again, is there a link between the buildup of Russian forces now on the Ukrainian border while this is taking place along the Polish border? Uh, Well, the link is uh, when we're looking at the roots of what's happening. So if you have the same source, of, of, of this, these events uh, as, as uh, directors of the performance. So this is uh, the linkage. Uh, I couldn't link directly what is happening, but usually when crisis is appearing, uh, sometimes they are coordinated to, to, to draw some attention maybe from one uh, crisis to another. So uh, it's linked because the same source, as I said, because Russia is a player everywhere and unfortunately not in positive way. So this is very direct linkage. How does this end? With more sanctions against Lukashenko? Not only Lukashenko, I would not forget Russia, as I said. This is the same same picture. But also, uh, with regard to Lukashenko, as you probably know, this fifth package is in preparation of sanctions, and uh, we have to speed up the process, that's for sure, and to make sure that they will be targeted, tangible, not only in individual sanctions, but also economic segment is very important. And to you know, to, to to sanction all these companies, and with our latest proposals, also to sanction airport, maybe the airport of Minsk, who's becoming a hub, harbor, you know, for all these events, and those uh, companies which are cooper- cooperating with this airport also should, should uh, take a note notice that this is something happening, and they are uh, del- deliberately or not, but they are part of this chain of of. Uh, of this crime, basically. So uh, the sanctions should be really more more speedy, more efficient, more targeted. And I would add not only against uh, Belarusians, but also Russia shouldn't feel impu- impunity in, in the context of these events. Linus Linkovicius, uh, always great to talk to you, sir, ambassador at large for Lithuania. Thank you so much. Appreciate it. Thank you. And that's our backstory on Belarus and the use of migrants as weapons and on Project Dynamo. If you want to help Afghans, Brian Stern's Project Dynamo is a great place to start. I'm Dana Lewis. Thanks for listening to Backstory, and I'll talk to you again soon.